Hello, this is Motan Mosby. This is the third interview I had with Dr. Roos. Uh, in this interview, Dr. Roos thinks I'm gay, but well, that's not the point. Uh, in this episode, we are going to talk about the ethical implications of the evolutionary theory. Uh, if you remember from the first episode, uh, he gave the example of ants, uh, among whom the females are the ones who do all the work, take care of the babies, take care of the queen, and take care of the nest, while the males are just chilling and doing nothing there. Until the mating season comes and one of the males fertilizes the the queen and the queen comes back with the uh, with half of his body hanging from her and when the mating season is over and the males have to have fulfilled their duty the females close the nest and the males will starve and freeze to death darwin thought that if it were ants, it would have been um, it would have been our moral calling to keep the males outside when their duty is fulfilled and let them freeze to death. In order to understand how we function morally, what our moral calling is, we need to understand what kind of beings we are and what kind of game we play. I hope you enjoy this podcast. If you do, please subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, tell your friends if it is possible for you, support me on Patreon or do all the above. Thank you. So I think this is the the interview that I've been looking forward to the most, uh, okay. considering the topic. So uh, you gave an introduction to, to this interest of yours, uh, the, the ethical implications of the evolutionary theory. Right. Uh, in order to know what we ought to do, we need to know what kind of creatures we are. So in this session, we'd like to delve deeper into this topic and know more okay. about it. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, yes. So do you want please... me to talk, or uh, are you asking me a question? Do you want me to talk now? Uh, first, uh, please give an introduction uh, about this topic, and they, then I have uh, some questions. If they are not covered, I will ask you after your introduction. Okay. Let's start then at the beginning. When Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859, he didn't say very much about morality. However, a number of other people, evolutionists, who read Darwin and then put their own interpretations on it, thought that what Darwin said, or thought that evolution had significant implications for our morality. And that's not, not a stupid belief, because after all, if we're modified monkeys rather than modified mud, in other words, if we're the products of evolution rather than the creation of a good God on the sixth day, then you'd expect that to have implications for the kind of beings we are and the kind of moral uh, beliefs that we have. So the one who picked up especially on this was Herbert Spencer. Now, Herbert Spencer, unlike Darwin, saw evolution as progressive. In other words, it's going from the blob up to the human necessarily. Now, Darwin believed that, but he didn't think it was a, a necessary thing. It, you know, it could, I mean, you know, you could get up to Englishmen and then suddenly degenerate to Iranians or something like that, you know, I mean, so Darwin thought, it, you know, at least it's possible to go up from the English down to Poles, Iranians and God, all the way down. Uh, so, but Spencer thought that it was progressive. And so Spencer argued that in order, what you ought to do is try to promote evolution. So if something leads, helps evolution, then 
that's what you should do. Now, amongst other things, Spencer said, well, what we need is the successful to succeed and the unsuccessful not to succeed. So he said that society should set itself up so it helps, you know, the bright young ones and the inadequate, the poor, the widows and orphans, you know, push them out, you know, to the wall. So that's social Darwinism. Now, a number of philosophers objected to this very strongly. And probably the best known is G.E. Moore in his book, Principia Ethica, published in 1903, where Moore said, you cannot go from statements about matters of fact, namely, this is how evolution works, to statements about morality, namely, this is what we ought to do. Hold on, I'm just going to disconnect. Well, apparently I'm not. I was going to disconnect my thing. OK, um, so what, what Moore said is that's impossible. Moore called this the naturalistic fallacy. So there we are then, 1903. We've got people like Spencer are pushing evolutionary ethics. And people like, uh, like Moore, the philosophers, are saying, no, it, it's impossible. It's fallacious. It's the naturalistic fallacy. And basically, that's the way that things went for at least until the middle of the century. I mean, occasionally there were people like uh, Julian Huxley, for instance, who tried to revive evolutionary ethics. But by and large, they got jumped on by philosophers. And certainly when I started doing philosophy uh, in 1960, it was one of the eternal verities, as we call it. I mean, there are some things which you know are true, like even the nicest boys only want one thing. That was what every mother said. Even the nicest boys, even nice people like you, Mo, you know, such nice boys, but you really only want one thing. And so that was an eternal verity. Uh, another one when I grew up was Americans have terrible table manners. Uh, we, the English were convinced that the Americans, they, they cut their meat up with a knife and then eat it with a fork. Oh, 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 instead of eating it with a knife and fork in a proper way. And the naturalistic fallacy was in that. Well, since then, a number of us have started to wonder whether that's the end of the discussion. Here we are. Uh, since then, as I say, a number of us have started to wonder if that's the end of the discussion. And uh, increasingly, we think, no, it's not. Now, how do you deal with the naturalistic fallacy? I, I, I mean, I think the naturalistic fallacy is right. I don't think you can go from matters of matters of fact to matters uh, of, uh, of morality. You know, uh, Moe's a nice young man. That's a fact. Moe should be, you know, made king of Poland. That, you know, ought to be. That's, that's a matter of morality. And I don't think they follow. Uh, I don't Maybe say you should be king of Poland, but I'm saying it doesn't follow from the fact that you're a very nice young man. So, so what do you do there? Well, you say perhaps you can do what uh, sports people call an end run. In other words, you don't go straight at the opposition. You go round it like that, you know, like that. And so what would that mean? Well, it means that what you've got to do then is avoid the naturalistic fallacy. So how do you do that? Well, the naturalistic fallacy says you cannot go from statements about fact to statements about morality. So why don't you say, well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, all I've got is statements of fact. Then what about justification of statements about morality? Well, you say, perhaps there's no justification. Maybe there's, now, note what I'm saying. There's no objective justification out there. Doesn't mean to say you can go out and do what you want, but it does mean that you're not going to find the objective justification either in the will of God, e external, or in platonic forms, external, or even in nature, external. What it's got to be somehow is from within. You believe morality because that's you're psychologically presupposed to do this. And the position is known as moral realism. It's not, it, moral, I'm sorry, moral, moral non-realism. So in other words, non-realistic. You, when you say non-realistic, what you mean is there's no referent in the objective real world. Doesn't mean to say you don't have morality. It just means if it's not going to be justified 
by something out there. It's going to be psychological. And obviously that means it's going to be a psychological predisposition. So in other words, what you're going to say then is morality is a little bit like a game that we're forced to play because we're human beings. Now, let's take, let's say, let's take soccer, okay? Soccer, uh, there are certain things you cannot do, like the offside rule. You cannot, for instance, put your center forward down by the, the opponent's goal and then just kick the ball down and hope he'll get it and put it in. You've got to, you can't do that. You ca- you've got to take it down, okay? So that's the offside rule. Now, there's no absolute reason why a game has to have the offside rule. You could have maybe another game, another form of the game, or maybe you could say, well, um, let's have two goalkeepers, or let's not have any goalkeepers. Let's just do it that way, that what you've got to do is defend the goal, but there's nobody. Or let's say this, you cannot have a goalkeeper who can hold the ball like that. In other words, the goalkeeper has to just use his feet. And of course, there are, as we now know, they have introduced rules about this. When I was young, the goalie could pick the ball up and just bounce it all that way. Now they're not allowed to do that. They can only do it, what, twice, and then they've got to kick it off. So you can change the game. So does that mean the game of football is not real? No, but it does mean the game of football doesn't have any external reference. It doesn't mean, I mean, in other words, it's a game that we make up And then once you're playing it, you've got to stick with the rules. Now, of course, the thing about morality is I would say we don't make it up. Our genes make it up. Our evolution made it up. Because those organisms who believed that you ought to be nice to, let's say, you ought to be nice to small children, tended to survive and reproduce. And those who said, every time you see a small child stamp on its face, tended not to. Why? Because other people were going to do that to your children. So you're much better off if you say, I see a small child, let's ask where, you know, and it's crying, let's pick it up and try and find its parents. Because apart from anything else, you hope that when your child gets lost and is crying, they'll meet it and they'll pick it up and try and find you. So in other words, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. So basically, I think that that's the way that certainly somebody like me wants to argue for evolutionary ethics today. In other words, I'm a moral non-realist. I don't believe that you can just... See, Herbert Spencer was a moral realist. He thought it's really true that evolution is progressive. That's a fact. And so it's a, since that's a fact and that it gets better, that's what we ought to do. In other words, what we ought to do is justified out there. But of course, that meant that Herbert Spencer saw that there were values in nature. And somebody like Ed Wilson and is another one who believes, he says, oh yes, it's obvious that there are real values out there. Now, the, the philosopher, the norm, the, uh, somebody like Moore, who argues for the, the naturalistic fallacy, says, no, there are no morals, uh, no values out there, you know, at least in that sort of way. They may be, uh, they may be, uh, you know, the platonic forms or something like that. So he's not saying you can't justify it. He's just saying you're not going to justify it in nature because nature is value free. Nature just is. So somebody like like Spencer or Ed Wilson says, no, I don't think nature just is. I think that nature has value in itself. That when I see, let's say, a, a child smile, and I think that's a wonderful thing. That's something objectively value out there. Whereas somebody like me wants to say, yes, I respond to it. I think it's beautiful, but it's me who makes the judgment that it's beautiful. Not out there, nor is it God, as it were, up there who says, oh, yes, it's beautiful. And you should obey what I say because I'm God. You know, and what I say goes. So in other words, a moral non-realist thinks that there are no objective values. But as I say, it does not follow that a moral non-realist believes that there's no morality. It's a question of where does the morality come from or how do you justify it? And the moral non-realist says there's no objective justification. It's all a matter of psychology. So it's like a game, but you have to play the game. And why do you play the game? 
because your genes make you think you should. In other words, so there's no. So if I say it's wrong to rape, I believe very strongly that it's wrong to rape. And I, I think if I see you raping, I'm going to try to stop you. But there's no objective what out there or something like that. It's put, we're all part of the human system, and that's the way it works. So as I say, I think evolutionary ethics today, uh, at least the way I like it, is one which pushes, as I say, moral non-realism. Now, I should say there are people like Edward O. Wilson who are still very much in the Herbert Spencer tradition. So there are today two different traditions, I think. There are, I mean, of, of evolutionary ethicists. There are those who say, oh, no, it's just ridiculous to say there's no value in nature. My friend uh, Robert J. Richards at the University of Chicago is one who argues that. He says, of course, there's value in nature. Of course, nature is progressive. Of course, we are objectively better than, what should we say, apes. And apes are objectively better than fish. And fish are objectively better than, you know. So in other words, somebody like Wilson says, I'm sorry, well, Wilson or Richards say, it's just ridiculous to say there's no value in nature. It's not your judgment that humans are superior to, let's say, to kangaroos or to, to, to apes. That's a fact. Whereas somebody like me wants to say, as a Darwinian, that's up for grabs. I mean, look, look at today. Gorillas, you know, are on the verge of going extinct, whereas the coronavirus is doing very well indeed. Now, you know, I mean, there's, I mean, am I to say, therefore, that the coronavirus is superior to gorillas? No, I don't want to say that. It's certainly doing better in the evolutionary game, but it doesn't mean to say it's my judgment which is superior, not out... Uh, it's not something I find out there, because if it's out there, then it all has to be related to evolutionary success. And I don't think it's necessarily the case that the best always succeed. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes they just don't. And so, you know, that's the way it goes. I mean, uh, what shall I say? Let's say in the last war, at one point, it was certainly quite plausible that Hitler would have won. And so we'd all be Nazis. So, but I don't think that would have been superior. Although, from a biological point of view, Hitler would have proved that he was better than us. So there you are. So I want to distinguish between getting better. But as I say, I don't think it's stupid. I mean, obviously, I mean, our, my initial reaction is to say, yes, obviously, humans are superior to apes. But the question is, where do I get that sense of superiority? And I want to argue we get it from within rather than finding it out there. So there's the one position then, sort of the Herbert Spencer tradition. And then the other tradition, let's call it, I like to call it the Darwinian position, although I'm not sure that Darwin himself always believed it. But I want to say this means relativistic. So it means that you have to put the meaning into the world, including ethical meaning. So yes, we've got ethics, but it's like a game which has no objective referent, except games are devised by human beings, whereas morality is devised by our genes. And so, whereas we might have control over, you know, the, the rules of a game, I mean, obviously, let's say, uh, changing the offside rule or something like that. Um, so we've got that choice. We don't have any choice with ethics. It's what our genes made us do. So there you go. How's that for a start? Yeah. So uh, from what I have heard from you, from your interviews, I guess that uh, accepting the fact that we are cooperative animals is central to this system of morality. Is that true? Yes. And how far can we go from that, for example, in accepting homosexuality, we can say that it exists in the nature, so it is... Well, I, I, no, what I'd want to say there is that often debates about morality are not about the morality as such, but about the facts. Now, I would say that it's a bad thing for teachers to, let's say, to seduce their children or to change their children in various sorts of ways. I think, obviously, if 
let's say I'm homosexual and you're not, and you're my student and I'm a gay, I don't think it would be right for me to influence you to become homosexual. But of course, so I can take that as a moral claim. I, I have no right to impose my lifestyle on my students. My job is to teach you not to change your, your lifestyle. Okay, so that's fine. But notice, changing your lifestyle isn't just the question of morality. It's the question of fact. Could I change your lifestyle? I'm gay. I'm a homosexual. You're straight. You're, you're, you're heterosexual. Could I, as a homosexual, influence you to turn from heterosexuality to homosexuality? Now, that is a matter of fact. Not, that's a fact. That's not morality. Now, I think what we'd often say is the reason why we're a lot more tolerant of homosexuals today is, first of all, we know that they didn't decide themselves to become homosexual. They didn't say, this is what I want to be. It was something they were when they were born, and they didn't have any choice about it. And we, as we know, you can't really change it. Once, you know, once you've got it, it, ain't, it, it can't be changed. But secondly, we also know that I'm not going to, I mean, yeah, if we're on a, you know, in a prison or something, but normally I can preach the gay lifestyle as much as I like to you. And you can say at the end, well, that's very nice, but there's a, there's a pretty girl over there. I'd rather go over there. You know, I mean, I'm that way. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I've met homosexuals, you know, who put the grabs on me. And the simple fact of the matter is I'm not interested. You know, it, it really, the thought of having a man's penis up my backside is, you know, it, it's awful. So it's not, but that's not a moral claim. That's not a moral claim. That's how I feel. That's a, a matter of fact. Now, whether I should, as your teacher, be able to say, nevertheless, I've got the right to have homosexual intercourse with you because you're my student. So turn over, turn around and drop your pants and bend over. Now, that, I think, is a moral claim. So that's a moral matter, whether I've got the right to impose my will on you, that sort of way. I mean, obviously, a teacher has the right to impose their will on somebody. You're in a classroom and you keep talking. I've got every right to say, Mo, sit down and shut up. OK, I've got every right to do that. That's within the confines of my duty as a teacher. What I don't have is the right to say, Mo, drop your pants, turn round and bend over. That's so. It, it, obviously, it's a question of boundaries, but within the, which we which we know. And what I'm saying is, you know, it's a moral claim that I should not, you know, force my homosexual attentions on you. But it's a, a factual claim as to whether or not doing that is going to turn you, you know, into a homosexual. It probably, you know, it probably isn't going to be good for your mental health. But that's another matter. I'm not going to make you gay. So I think so often these questions are not questions of morality, but questions of matters of fact. Even uh, difficult ones like abortion. Everybody agrees you shouldn't kill other human beings. Everybody agrees to that. The question is, what are other human beings? Is the you know, one week old fetus, the fertilized ovum, is this a human being or not? Whereas a lot of us would want to say, no, it's not. So even if you think abortion's unfortunate, I don't look upon it as murder. Whereas, of course, a lot of Roman Catholics want to say, and evangelicals want to say, as soon as fertilization takes place, a, an immortal soul gets in there, and so it's a human being. So even if you abort a one-week-old fetus, uh, that's murder. So, but again, it's what we're arguing about are matters of fact, or actually, or matters of, if you like, matters of theology. We're not arguing matters of morality. Morality, yes, we will all agree that you ought not kill human beings. Now, I mean, there are times when you want to debate that. I mean, what about euthanasia of the very sick? Suppose you've got cancer and it's very, very painful. We know you're going to die in six months. But if, as it is, we don't have any cure for it, and we don't have any medical things. So you are going to have six months of absolute agony and then die. And so you say to us, please 
you know, kill me now because I don't. Now, I think that's a diff that that. Yes, that gets into moral issues about whether there are times when it's, you know, it nevertheless, it's not only allowable, maybe morally right to do this, uh, that, yes, there are times when what one ought to do is is this sort of thing. But that's another matter. I'm talking about abortion as such. And there, I think it's a question of matters of fact. Again, though, even if it's euthanasia, the question is, the first question I'm going to ask is, what's your illness? How does it affect you? Is it curable? I mean, if you say to me, I've got it, it's terribly uncomfortable, but I know that in a month uh, after that, it will go and I'll be healthy for the next 10 years. I'm probably going to say, then I don't think you should be allowed to kill yourself. You're going to have to tough it out. On the other hand, if you say, and it's true, I'm going to have six months of agony and then die, that's a different matter. But again, these are matters of fact rather than matters of morality. So as I say, so often discussions about morality are not just discussions about what's morally right, but what's, what is factually the case. And so often when we're trying to make decisions, you know, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? You know what you want to do. But the question is, you don't know what the best route is. If I, let's say, uh, if, let's say I'm a doctor, if I operate now, well, will this cure it? Or should I, you know, go with medical treatment? Uh, for the... Now, often you don't know. You're making a decision and you're having to, as it were, work on insufficient evidence. And so, of course, that's why so often you get moral dilemmas where it's not easy to work out exactly what is going to happen. Is, this, is the child going to recover if I do this? Is it going to recover better if I do this? And of course, then you've got all these decisions that you have to make. And often it's not easy. Not, sometimes, you, you know, often it's not easy to say that what's the right thing, but you have to go on a, on a thing. I mean, look, let's take a professor and students. You catch the student cheating. Now, what should you do? Should you, you know, go, you know, all out and bomb them, kick them out of university? Or should you say, you made a mistake? I can understand that. Now, let's look at why you made the mistake and let's see if we can do it so you won't make the mistake again. Now, at certain levels, you're, you're taking a risk because, you know, we all know sometimes it works, sometimes it, any professor like me over the years says, oh, yes, you know, I've had students and I've given them a break and they've really come through and that makes it all worthwhile. But I've had others, I've given them a break and it made absolutely no difference. They just took advantage of me. Now, then what the professor says is, what should I do in the future? Should I still be prepared to give students a break? Or should I say, no, I'm just, they take advantage of me just too much. I'm not gonna do it anymore. So again, as I say, these are decisions that you have to make. But they're not necessarily in themselves. They're not moral decisions. They're decisions about what is going to happen. If I do this, will the student behave in this way or that way? And once I know that, then I can say what I ought to do. If I know, for instance, that I've got a 90 percent chance of success, then I'm probably going to say, then let's go ahead and give them a break. If I know I've only got a 5 percent of ch chance of success, and it's much more likely, I'll say, sorry, you know, I, unless you can give me more evidence to show me why you're more than the 5 percent, I really am not prepared to do anything. So there you go. OK, so uh, now here's the question. Uh, several times you refer to the idea that we all know that it is wrong to kill another human being. I want to know where does this come from? How do you support this idea with respect to uh, this evolutionary uh, ethical system? OK, what, what's the question? How do I support what with respect to evolution? How do you support the idea that we shouldn't kill other people? You said oh, that we see. all know that we shouldn't kill other people. How can this well, be supported? Well, I mean, obviously, once again, we make, a, we, we make a distinction, don't we? If I saw you, a big, strong guy, 
going after a little girl and I knew you were going to rape her. And I said, please don't. You, you turned around and said, forget I'm going to, but you happen to have a gun. Then at some point you might well say, look, if you don't stop, I'm going to shoot you. Now, I think that most people would be inclined to say there are times when it, you don't want to, but there are times when you, you not only can kill people, but maybe you should kill people. And so I think that there's this discussion. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a lot of debate, for instance, about capital punishment. Should you execute murderers? And there's going to be a lot of discussion about, yes, you should, or no, you shouldn't. So, I mean, you're going to have those. So I'm not saying it's always easy, but I am saying, no, of course, there's going to be differences. Pacifists, for instance, let's say the Second World War. I think most people would say, yes, it was right that France and Britain declared war on Germany in, on September 3rd, 1940, after Germany invaded Poland. Whereas, of course, others, Quakers, my father would have said, no, I think that's wrong. You, you should never, ever kill others. And, you know, if, if it ends up you being killed, I'm a Christian. God will make it all right in the end. You know, in other words, ultimately, it's not my decision. It's God's decision. So, of course, you're going to get differences over those sorts of things. But if you don't, you know, if you're not extreme, so often, let's face up to it, most of the time, I won't say all of the time, but a lot of the time, people agree that it was right to go and fight Hitler. I, I think that if you ask people in, certainly in Britain, uh, or let's say Americans in Japan, should America have responded against the bombing of Pearl Harbor by declaring war on Japan. I think you'd find very few Americans who would say it was wrong to declare war on Japan. That, that not only was it not wrong, but that's what we should do. Uh, like I think very few Brits in England in, at the beginning of September 1940 would say it's wrong to declare war on Hitler. Even those who are pacifists might say, I think it's wrong, but I certainly can see why you don't think it's wrong. In other words, I think there'd be, there would be a difference between somebody who's saying, well, my pacifism, my religious belief says fighting is always wrong between somebody like that and, and somebody, but they could then say, but I understand why you take a different position from me. I think you're wrong, but I can understand that. Whereas, you know, if you're just a mad brute going around shooting people, I think you might say, not only do I think you're wrong, but I can't understand why you're doing it. So I think you've got, you can introduce those nuances, as we call them, of, of you know, understanding. Hmm. So uh, I'm trying to understand this more by uh, discussing more of the examples that you just provided or more examples that come to my mind. You, for example, said that if you see me raping someone, you would stop me. And do you believe that every human being would do that? Yes, I think so. I mean, of course, you run into trouble. I mean, what about policemen? Do Quakers believe in having policemen? Mm -hmm. I think most Quakers would say, yes, they do believe in having policemen. But we know that part of you know, giving authority to policemen is that sometimes they're going to use violence. They, you know, they meet a robber or a shooter or some. I mean, if you say to the policeman, you cannot resist. Well, every time they met a robber, the robber would just say, you know, go away, go away. I'm going to do it and you can't stop me. So I think most of us, you know, who agree to have a police force would say, yes, at some level, we have to give the police an element of, uh, of, of right to do force. Although, again, you have differences in America, for instance, the police are always armed. They have guns. Whereas in England, the police don't. I mean, generally speaking, the police don't have guns. They may have truncheons, you know, batons to bash you, but they don't. They police don't carry guns. So, I mean, there's differences at that sort of level. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, where does this opposition to rape come from? How can uh, my question is how this. Can be well, supported. I think the answer, the answer to that question is those communities in the past which had these kind of rules about behavior 
basically were more successful than those that didn't. I mean, if, if you've got a society and you cannot leave the house without worrying that your wife is going to be raped or your daughter, then you're not going to have a very happy existence. You're probably not going to be prepared to go, you know, off on a sales trip or anything like that. You're just not going to do that. I mean, even now, as I'm talking to you, I'd be listening to hear if somebody's coming in. But of course, if you've got these rules, which basically say, don't do it, but I not only don't you do it, but I won't do it. I shouldn't do it. We, none of us should do it. Then, of course, we can start to have a stable functioning society and a society which is functioning, where we're working together, where we're getting things done, is going to be more successful than a society which isn't. I mean, even if, let's suppose we're all farmers. You've got two groups of farmers. The one group of farmers work together, they grow their crops, and every now and then, you know, something happens, your barn falls down, so the others come over and say, let me help you, okay? I suspect they're going to be better at growing vegetables than another group of farmers who say, no, I'm not going to help you. And every time I see one of your daughters, I'm going to grab her. Thank you. My wife's bringing me a cup of tea. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I suspect they're not going to grow as many vegetables as the, as the group which are. So I think it's, you know, at one level, I think it's just basically bi basic biology that you have certain rules about, you know, caring about children, protecting women, uh, and, and not only women, but the young and the old, uh, all of the, the sick. I think, you know, I don't think it's stupid or, or peculiar that we have these sorts of rules, because apart from everything else, you're going to be young sometime, and you may well, very well be uh, old sometime, and you're certainly going to be sick sometimes. And, you know, uh, I mean, you're going to be sick. Do you want when you, let's say, broken a leg, that everybody just laughs at you and says, ha ha, I'll take what you've got because you can't stop me. Or if they, uh, or a society which says, ah, let us help you. Let us see if we can help you bind your leg. And while we're doing this, we'll, you know, we'll bring in the crop. We'll look after, we'll milk the cows for you or something like that. Uh, the society which does that is going to be a much better function and have more offspring, more babies than a society which doesn't. So I don't see that there's any big miracles about this. But more than this, you see, if we just thought we'd like to do this, well, of course, then the trouble is we could break it. I might say, oh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to help you, but hey, I'm a bit tired or I, I'd rather go off and have a drink instead. But if I say, aha, I ought to help you, even though I don't want to help you right now, I know I should help you, so I will help you. Morality is, as it were, makes it work better. I mean, I think you could get on with just feelings, but the trouble is, often you have the feelings and you, you know, you don't want to help. You know, you, your kid wants something or something like that. You say, ah, oh, no, I'm tired, forget it. Or no, oh, I'm tired, I really don't. But come on, get your homework out and let me see if I can help you. you know? I mean, that's, or you see, you know, a neighbor who's, you know, old or something, you say, come on, dear, give me your shopping list and I'll go down to the store and, and get it for you. Now, you know, I think often you'd be happy to do that. But sometimes, you know, you're tired or you're busy or whatever. And you'd say, yeah, no, I don't think I'll bother. But if you say, no, that's what I really ought to help this person, then I think it's going to work better. So I don't see a moral sense as miraculous or strange. I see moral sense as something which facilitates being social. I mean, I don't think there's any big mystery about any of this. It's just a question of seeing how it works. So there is some um, biological force behind it that derives it, and that derives it forward. Yes, I think there are. And I think a lot of people find it difficult to think that it's all psychology. I mean, on the other hand, you know, somebody who follows David Hume certainly thinks it's psychology. Obviously, somebody who follows Immanuel Kant thinks that there's, you know, necessary conditions for, you know, for behaving as a rational person. And these are, as it were, laid upon us. Whereas I think David Hume wants to say, well, yes, but it's, it's ultimately it's all psychology. There's no, there's nothing beyond human psychology. And the reason why we've got this psychology rather than some other psychology is that those who had another psychology 
aren't here anymore. Whereas we are because we were successful with the psychology that we've got. Those who, I mean, it's just not immorality. Those of us who learned that a fire is going to hurt you, so stay away from it, are going to survive. And those who say, ah, oh, fire, let's put our hand in it, are not. So, I mean, it, again, it, it's psychology. It's not, you know, there's nothing objective. It's just, how do I feel? And if you feel this way, you're going to do better than if you feel this way. Hmm. So my next question was going to be that, uh, are we supposed to get to a certain uh, set of rules, uh, unified rules that are universal rules? But I think uh, with respect to what you said uh, at the end of the, this uh, well, section. Well, I think that's a good uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a good question. And I think generally speaking, we are going to have certain rules like be kind to children. Okay? Uh, help, you know, the poor, help help the elderly, help the sick. I think yeah, we uh, you know, we are going to have those sorts of rules. But I could see situations where I'm not sure I I mean no adaptation works perfectly. It, it never worked, you know, I mean, it's good to be able to walk up upright, but if you're fleeing from a tiger, it would be better if you're four-legged rather than two-legged. My, you know, my, my little dogs are going to be faster at esca escaping from the tiger than I am. So, you know, so uh, walking on two legs isn't always the best. So, uh, you know, evolution is a question of compromises. Generally speaking, it's better to be bipedal than it is to be, uh, at least for us, than to be, you know, four-legged. I mean, generally speaking, it's better to have big brains than small brains. But obviously, if, you know, a, a planet wipes out, you know, some all, practically all the vegetation, you'd probably be better to be a cow or a sheep than a human being. You know? huh. So, I mean, I think that's how it, how it works. Now, I see that quite possibly with morality. I mean, there's a famous one, what they call in English, the, uh, the trolley problem. If you're, you know, if you're, uh, you're, see, you see a, 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 a track, with, and on the one side of the track, you've got five people tied up, and on the other side of the track, you've got one person tied up, and a truck is coming down, should you divert it this way, or should you divert it that way? And of course, the answer is, well, if you've got a switch, most of us would say, yes, divert it to kill the one person rather than the five people. Now, similar situation, but a bit different. There's five people on the track and you're standing next to a big fat man. It can't be a thin man or like yourself because it won't work. It's got to be a fat man. Now, if you push the fat man over onto the track, it will kill him, but save the five. Should you do this? And of course, the answer is a lot of people would say, no, I shouldn't do this. I, you know, I, it would be wrong, even though I'm saving five, it would be wrong to push my neighbor over onto the track like that. Now, I think most moral philosophers would want to say there has to be a right answer here. You know, it must be one or the other, or we can find ways. I want to say maybe there is no right answer. I mean, most of the time, I mean, let's face up to it, it's artificial. But the thing is, by and large, we are, as it were, psychologically conditioned to think that we should help our neighbors, that the people that we live with, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't push them on tracks, Even, especially we shouldn't put them on tracks for strangers that we've never met. You know, if, I mean, that, you know, we'd say, I don't care. It, it would be wrong to push Mo onto the track. Mo, I've grown up with Mo. He's one of my students. He's a nice guy. I know he's just going to get married. He love, he's in love with this boy. He's, they, the two of them are going to get married and have a nice home together. And they're going to be two nice young gay people who are going to open an antique shop and live a happy life. You know, now, is it OK to push Mo onto the tracks, even though I'm saving five people that I, I've never met? Never met. You know, and I think most of us would say, I, you know, I just couldn't do it. I mean, you know, mm. Mo's my friend. He's my student. You know, I like Mo. I'm so happy for his future. I'm an old man. Mo's at the start of his life. 
He's so excited about his life. Do you mean I'm supposed to kill Mo to save him? No. So, uh, but here I think you've got an interesting case, two different situations. Whereas if you're in a situation where there's no involvement, emotional involvement about making the decision, it's just pull the switch or not. You don't know the person on the one side. You don't know the people on the fight other side. They're just five people, one person. Pull the switch on. I think mm. most would say, well, of course, we don't have that commitment. So, yeah, we should make the decision. Five more, five is greater than one. And so that's what we should do. And so you do that. Now, of course, if I could give you a lot of information, say the five people are all very old and going to die within a week, whereas the one person is Mo, a young person at the, at the start of his life. And that's a different matter. But the, the situation, the problem is there's five and there's one. And as far as we can know, they're exactly the same, five to one. And it's just a question of pulling a switch. I think most would say, you know, pull the switch. I think when, if it's a question of killing Mo, somebody that we know, then it's a different situation. So there would be a case where philosophers, moral philosophers, would normally say, there must be a solution. Let's work on it more and see if we can find one. Whereas I want to say, I'm not sure there is a solution. I, you know, sometimes adaptations break down. And I think this is a case where it is. And so I'm inclined to say that this in fact, is a case in, in favor of my position, that there are times when, you know, mora it's, it, morality isn't something, you know, given by God or, you know, on stones, you know, that Moses brought down from, you know, from meeting God up, a, up on the mountain. I mean, morality is, you know, an adaptation. It's, it's, the, it's a way that we, that we function. It, it's just like eating and having sex and, you know, having a crap. I mean, these are adaptations that we have. You know, we need to take in food. We need to create babies. We need to expel the waste. I mean, you know, I mean, you might say, well, you know, making poop, having a shit or whatever it is, is not very nice. Yeah, but it, there's a reason for it. Namely, you've got to get rid of that waste. And so this is the way that we do it. And by and large, it's a pretty efficient way of doing it. And so Let's get on with it. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be nice. It has to work. And that's what I would want to say. It's the same with morality. Does morality work? And by and large, it does. But sometimes, these, as we all know, these things are not going to work, that these things are going to break down. I mean, uh, for instance, you may, well, we know. I mean, for instance, <clears throat> in modern society, people eat far too much. So here's a case where, by and large, you know, I could see why there were adaptive reasons why we should look for sweet things. We see a bee's nest or something, because having the sweet things gives you energy. And you're out and, you know, hunter and gathering, get some sweet things, it gives you energy. But in our society, you know, I'll have two spoons of you know, sugar in my coffee and I'll have a second cup. It's not a good thing. So sometimes these things break down and, you know, depending on the circumstances. So the fact, as I say, the fact that morality sometimes doesn't work. I mean, I think the trouble is most of us think that morality is something given by God, you know, or it is something mathematical. Two plus two equals four and never could ever equal anything but four. Or you know, as it was in the beginning, as it is now, as it always will be, you know. But I don't, you know, I think morality is a different thing. I think it, I, that's how they think of it. But me, I think morality is an adaptation and I think it works pretty well most of the time. But I'm not surprised that sometimes it breaks down. And I, I think we often say that. We say, yes, I know what you should do if we were just considering it. But, you know, I've got to make a decision. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a, a let's say I'm a, a soldier, a, not even a general. I'm a major. And I've got, you know, a group of my, my, of my crew or something like this. And now, OK, we're doing fine. But then I realize, you know, we're not going to work if, we're, if we, we keep carrying the injured. Well, I think sometimes you have to say, I'm sorry, folks. I know under normal circumstances, it would be terrible to leave our injured behind. Even worse if we shot them. But I'm sorry. I'm responsible for 100 men here. I've got 10 injured. 
if we care for those injured, I'm going to lose 50 of my men. I'm going to come home with 40. Whereas I'm sorry, if we abandon those 10, I'm going to come home, let's say, with 80. Okay, I'm going to have to do wrong. It's wrong to leave an injured soldier behind. But there are times when, you know, you have to make a decision. And I've been given the responsibility. You don't have to like me, but this is what we're going to do. And I, so I'm not, you know, I think that's what happens with morality. It works most of the time really well, but there are going to be situations where it simply doesn't. And uh, as I say, I think at times like that, you just have to, <coughs> you just have to put up with it and get on with it. I find it quite convincing, and it was very reassuring to hear that in your trolley example, in all of the examples that you gave, uh, I was the survivor. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm trying to bring you into it. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying not to push you onto the rails. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I want, you to, I want you to go off and marry your boyfriend and have a happy life together. Uh, okay. Uh, but I don't have a boyfriend. You don't <laughs> I am... have a boyfriend. Oh, I thought you did. <laughs> Everybody thinks that. Have you got a girlfriend? Yeah, yeah. Even she thought oh, I was, well, I yeah. was gay. You're, di you're a disappointment. I thought you were going to be somebody that we could actually talk about and why I, it's not right for me to... Ha okay, well, you, you disappoint me, Mo. I didn't realize <laughs> that you were just such a, oh. a basic, ordinary human being. Oh, so if we go back, you will throw me under the trolley, I guess. No? I certainly will. Oh, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, Mo... You're, you're, you're toast. You're, you're done for. <laughs> oh. oh, too bad. Particularly, particularly if it's Englishmen on the track. If oh. there's five yeah. Englishmen and one Mo, uh, I'm sorry, Mo. <laughs> it's too bad, but they are English. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get the feeling behind that. So uh, I, I don't uh, want to take much more of your time. So if you want to introduce one of Can your... Can I just say something? For a moment, yeah, sure. Mo. Sure. Notice that I'm joking with you. I think an important part of being a teacher and, and a philosopher, but I think an important part of being a teacher is to make these examples come alive and to make them in. I don't th I mean, talking about ethics. We're talking about really serious, important things. But if we sit, you know, and look like we're in church, you know, as we say, a Presbyterian, you know, I don't think that's the way to do it. I think you've got to bring these examples to life. And that's, as you can see, that's what I'm trying to do with you and everything like that. Okay, go on. Uh, sure. Uh, makes uh, a great lot of sense. So uh, if, you would, if you want to introduce one of your books uh, to know more about this topic, which one would you suggest? Well, um, I've just... Actually, I've just written a new book called, uh, what's it called? Uh, a Philosopher Looks at Human Beings. Looks. Now, have you seen that? Did I yes, send yes. you, and I've sent you the, the, late, the, the cover. The draft, yeah. I have that's right. read the so introduction. I, I think if you wanted to show people, that would be, the, now that's coming out, I, I think it'll be out by Easter. It'll be out, it certainly will be out in six months. And I discuss all of these issues right there. And, you know, I give some back. Also, importantly, I give some, you know, background to it. I give some uh, scientific background and some philosophical background. So I, I don't just, you know, it's not like a one hour talk where I plunge right in. You know, I've got time like a philosopher to talk too much. And I go back and I go back and then I can introduce it. And it comes up to what I think is a climax and what I say is for me the most important part, talking about morality. But I don't just introduce it cold. So that's certainly one place where I've talked about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so and uh, that's why in previous emails, I also mentioned that in the third interview that we are going to have, we are going to discuss that book that you, are, uh, you have accepted for print. Yes, yes. Now, I've written about it in other books. Um, hold on. I'm just sitting in my living room where I've got all my books up on the shelf so you can see them up there. And uh, hold on. Uh, this is a book that I've recently edited oh, a couple of years ago with my, with my friend. I was telling you about Bo Robert J. Richards, my friend. 
on evolutionary ethics. And I've got an essay, but there's lots of other essays in it which discuss a lot of aspects. And some people agree with what I'm saying, but most of the people don't. But as you know, philosophy is no fun if everybody agrees. <laughs> Half, I mean, people don't understand that about philosophy. They say, you're, oh, you're always arguing. And they don't realize that that's how philosophers work, that you work by disagreeing with other people, with, you know, perfecting your ideas by playing off against them. So, uh, and, you know, that's what we like to do. You have to be that sort of person. And so, uh, as I say, not everybody agrees. Most of the people don't agree with what I say in that book, but some do. And certainly I do. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time.